It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ren Dongyang. Uh, and I'm here speaking in the foreign hall with a fair number, um, fewer than normal, but uh, uh, more than usual number of uh, live audience members. And then I hope those who participate remotely can also hear me. Um, Dr. Ren Dongyang is visiting us from University of Minnesota. Um, he is, uh, his past uh, track brought him, uh, well, initially started at the Chinese Agricultural University where he obtained a bachelor degree in computer science and PhD in bioinformatics. Subsequently, um, he received postdoctoral training at Emory University with uh, Steve Chen, a lot of us know him. Yeah, and uh, Ting Wei Yu. So uh, that was 2011 and 2014. Uh, afterward, he uh, went to University of Minnesota initially as a, a bioinformatic analyst, then uh, rose to become a faculty member and assistant professor. Uh, he's been assistant professor in the Hormel Institute since 2017. Uh, Dr. Yang. Uh, works on uh, epigenomics, method development, uh, algorithmic innovation, innovations, especially with next-gen data. He is going to uh, talk with us about, uh, I'm just reading his title, discovery of a new mechanism for genetic change, exitron splicing implications for carcinogenesis and immunotherapy. So here uh, he will take off his mask because we are uh, suitably away a few rows uh, toward the back. Welcome. Uh, everyone you hear me, right? Okay, right? Okay. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lee, for a very nice introduction. And also thanks again for invitation so that I have the opportunity uh, to visit, uh, you know, the Michigan today uh, to talk about our recent work about actually transplicing and how it's implicated in carcinogenesis and uh, cancer immune therapy. Um, so before I go into further about active transplicing, I will just briefly mention about our prior uh, research work related to cancer genomics. And also I want to show the story how, what our discovery lead to the, you know, our new research on active transplicing study. So my lab is work on uh, cancer genomics. Uh, mainly we want to develop tool to find the, uh, you know, uh, alterations occurred in cancer. So we know that cancer is a uh, uh, genetic disorders. They have a lot of genetic alterations. For example, the uh, point mutations and also the insertion deletions uh, and, and also some copy number change and even larger scale structural rearrangement change. Also, they have uh, epigenetic alterations like methylation, chromaline actions. All these are very uh, kind of uh, central thoughts to the cancer genomic field. So, mouse, okay. So, um, so for cancer, usually like to study the cancer genome, the people do the sequencing. They do the sequencing for uh, tumor samples and also normal samples. And also the, the, for the computational side, people develop tools to detect the different like SMV, copy number, uh, indels, and also structural rearrangement. So many tools have been developed, maybe I still uh, sit here. Many, many people have developed tools here, uh, you know, very, use, very, very often used like Varscan, JTK for the uh, SNP and indel detections, and also like a break dancer, maybe Lampy, Dali for the structural rearrangement detections. And also many, uh, there are like a large scale effort, for example, TCG or ICGC, recently generated a lot of sequencing data. And uh, based on this sequencing data, people call mutations and try to find the genes enriched with the mutation. Here shows the recent list, uh, the top driver genes based on mutation profile, for example, TB53 and BRAP, et cetera. All this efforts has been conducted based on the shorter sequencing. 
uh, but there's still very uh, a, a lot of challenges to try to address the problem detect these different type of mutations. Uh, we can see from this figure, uh, because the read length is short, uh, the accuracy of detecting different uh, uh, type of mutations actually dropped uh, dramatically if the size of the mutation gets larger and larger. So that's uh, bring some our early effort to to develop tools for this uh, like uh, different type of mutation or uh, alteration detections. So we developed the scan in Dell in 2015, which is a hybrid framework utilize multiple heuristic uh, uh, signals to detect uh, the indels from the whole spectrum. We also uh, developed the trans indel, uh, which is a follow up work. We try to de detect the indels from both the DNA and also RNA levels. Um, we also developed tools to detect uh, large scale like structural variations. Uh, for example, the recent tool we developed is the scan ITD, which detect internal time duplications. Uh, and also we developed uh, tools for the structural rearrangement uh, uh, detections for entering receptor, which specifically apply to prostate cancer research uh, that we have to correlate with some like uh, 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 whether or not they have some functions from their geometry real random event. Uh, we also de detect, uh, we also develop tools for some even downstream further. Uh, for example, recently we published scan new tools. Um, it's detect new antigens that derive from the indels. So if indels change the proteins, they may generate some novel peptides. And if the peptides are recognized by the immune uh, system, they have, they have some immunogenic potential to generate new antigens. And we find that we developed a tool to try to infer uh, in Dell derived new antigens from the RNA seeking data. So one thing I want to highlight the story, this uh, actually, this is the story stars our electron splicing work. Um, when we developed the tools called trans we, 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 we our aim is to try to detect indels from the RNA from the RNA seq, uh, so because in RNA seq there is the also splicing junctions, we want to find the bona fide indels. So we want to find uh, we want to define several uh, criteria to remove these uh, false positives. So here just uh, shows the work. We indeed for these tools we can detect indels from whole exon sequencing, which is the DNA seq and also RNA sequencing, and then. Uh, they for the for the for the indels commonly de detect from these two uh, uh, layers of information, we can find very good correlations. But we find some actually some 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 very surprised result when we look at the concordance between the whole exon sequencing and RNA seq for the indels. We actually show very minimal overlap between them. We 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 have some explanation for exon sequencing only indels. It's maybe they are not expressing RNA at all, but we saw a lot of uh, insertions, deletions, especially for deletions, they detected in RNA seq, but we did not find them in the whole match the whole exon sequencing data. So here I show you one example in this figure F. Um, it's a ZBTB18 gene. We find the deletion from the RNA seq in its exon region. Uh, you can show the here, this is like a, a black bar, show the deletion signal from the sequencing data. But going back to the whole exon sequencing, we didn't find any evidence showing this uh, deletion event. And it's not because they are low coverage, they have very sufficient coverage, but just that the, 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 the we cannot find the you know, supporting evidence from the whole exon sequencing data. So, and also we, later we confirm using our, our RT-PCR for both the cDNA and our genomic DNA. We confirmed in RNA, but we didn't find in our in in the in the DNA side. Uh, we want to find, you know, how what 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 is that? Why they only appears in the RNA level? So it turns out in the literature, uh, there's a term called exit charm. Uh, it's a kind of a splicing event because it's only appeared in the RNA level, uh, and then we find this exit trans are really recurrent across, you know patient sample, this is the prostate cancer patient samples. 
and it enriched it top enriching are from the tumor suppressor genes and also some prostate cancer related related genes. This suggests us to think about uh, excitrons could be uh, maybe uh, something really interesting target for the cancer research. Um, so here is a very nice figure shows what is exactly excitron. It's a creative introns within the annotated axons. So here is the pre-MRA. It's uh, composed by the coding axon and the introns. So usually when they when they deliver the to uh, a messenger RA, the exon will be kept, but the intron will be spliced out. Extron actually is another region, it's a region within the coding axons. Generally, they will be retained and will deliver to normal transcript in our level. So they will generate normal protein as a forms, but sometimes they have splicing potential, so they can be cut out. And if they are spliced out, they will change the protein. They will generate some abnormal uh, isoform in RNA and also abnormal isoform in protein levels. So if this lens of x strong is a multiple of three nucleotide, it changes the protein like uh, in-frame deletions. If it's uh, not a multiple of three nucleotide, you change your frame shift event. So this will looks like a deletion, right? Based on our discoveries. But actually, they are just a curved deletion. We call it deletion in RNA level. Actually, it's a splicing event. So this term is first introduced by this uh, by this genome research paper published in 2015. Uh, before they just arbitrary some arbitrary name they call maybe a cryptic introns. So these authors actually summarize uh, a little bit, uh, dig into this exitrons in plant and they also show some data in human so they have a few human tissue samples and show the few exitrons are, are differentially expressed across the you know normal tissue samples they also test a little bit how it correlated with cancer so they have one uh, erbb2 positive breast cancer tissue and also a normal breast tissues they find a few exitrons are different spliced based on based on the splicing profile in cancer, suggesting they may be somehow related to cancer disease. So they have some features for extron. They find extron have weak splice site, have a higher RGC content, and some are like a contain site for numerous post translational modification site, and also enriched for protein disorder regions. Based on their report and our discoveries for the for the prostate cancer. We, we saw that exitron may, 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 may play a role, like a new, uh, new layer for related to the cancer research, but there are not too many follow-up uh, report or studies since the initial publication of the genome research paper. So we come up with uh, a few questions we want to answer. Uh, does exitron actually, uh, they have a high abundance in, across the human cancers? Uh, what is the potentially the mechanism controlling this exon splicing event? Because it's different from maybe other splicing event, and also how this exon splicing event, you know, impact gene function because they may change the protein structures. And lastly, how that may be even employed for cancer immunotherapy. So to come, to answer this question. We uh, have a, a plan for perform the pan cancer uh, analysis. We hope that we can try to answer this question as cons uh, as cons comprehensively as possible. So we use the data from TCGA uh, of thirty three cancer types, and also about they include about nine thousand six hundred tumor samples. They have the RNA data available. We also include the match normal tissues from the TCGA. Then we also include the GTAX cohort, which include uh, also many tissues and also uh, about 9,600 samples. So here is uh, the list of the samples from TCGA and GTAX we are using for our research. And also we include additional data like DNA, uh, mutation data, RNA, RNA uh, strand data, and also proteomic data from the CPTC cohort. So we aim to answer a few questions. For example, we, could we identify the tumor associated or tumor specific acron splicing event 
could they find the genes enriched with this actron splicing event? And then what's their relationship uh, with uh, you know, DNA mutations? Because they make all change the protein as a form and how they can be applied to immunotherapy, they may, uh, a source of, they may be a source of cancer new epitope. So this, uh, uh, we start with the first question, we want to explore the landscape of acutrons across the cancer, cancer disease. Uh, first of all, we need to have a weapon. So to, because acutrons really are emerging type of splicing event. Uh, although alternative splicing has been studied in the field for many years, but mostly they focus on some basic model of splicing. So extra has now been included in, the, in this computational toolbox. So we want to develop a tool that's come up with the scan extron. We developed this tool that's specifically designed to identify the extrons based on this workflow I showed, and also quantify the expression of the extrons. Uh, what the fraction, what the fraction of this trans extron splice transcript versus the fluence transcript. Uh, because this target for the RNA seq is used short read sequencing, and we calculate this PI, we call PSO, it's person splice out of value. Uh, we use the junction read supporting this extron and also the read uh, map across this extron region to calculate the fraction shape, uh, fra fraction. Uh, it turns out when we look at the extron expression across all the tumor types, we find a few tumors, for example, ovarian cancer. Uh, and also maybe leukemia, uh, st uh, stomach cancer, they have a high burden of exitrons. And then we'll also look at the, how that, uh, you know, uh, spread to genes. Uh, we find in TCJ cohort, uh, over 60% of genes, they have exitron splicing event. But in the GTAC samples, we only have like 17% of genes takes this exitron splicing event. When we did a situation analysis, when we downsampled the, downsampling the samples, we want to see whether or not a specific sample number can reach a situation for number of genes that takes the exitrons. Actually, we did not actually find any uh, situation. It still steadily uh, grow. So suggesting if we have more samples, for example, more than 9,600 samples, we may have more genes uh, that sort of can be found to include this uh, this exitron event. Uh, the next, we also need to validate our I have a question. Yes. This is a very striking finding, of course. Have you also found uh, translated regions in introns? We reported that from um, certain genes involved in Alzheimer's disease, both in animal models and in humans, yes. from Institute of Systems Biology a few years ago. And a former graduate student here. Have you found such uh, translated regions of introns as well as these exitrons? Yes, that's actually a very great, very great. <laughs> yes, that's a very great question. Actually, if I go uh, go further, I could, I I will, I will, this slide I will talk about even in translation of introns. Sometimes they are called uh, intron retention, right? If the the intron is going to retain. That can also translate to protein, cause some truncated protein, or maybe trigger then some nonsense mid decay. Our focus is just the exit trans. Uh, it's not in intron region, actually, just uh, here, like um, here is in intron, uh, in the exon region. So that's kind of different from the uh, uh, retained introns. But, but I did agree that there are definitely some intron regions that can be translated and they may be caused by the intron retention. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we start to validate our computational predictions and using the called long read sequencing technology because our, our predictions, our calculation is based on the short read sequencing. Uh, there are a few, uh, you know, um, uh, things we need to pay attention. Short, because read is short, sometimes it's very, very easily to introduce some artifact, especially for alignment artifact. And also the second question, we want to use long read because long read can sequence your fragment in your very large scale and it can get, get you the full length, full length transcript, transcript structure. 
And we want to evaluate our quantification method using PSO, if that accurate or not. Uh, however, we use the wrong read, we can actually quantify our electron splice, the transcript. So here's what we have done. We use the uh, SKBR3, which is a breast cancer uh, cell line. Uh, they have the uh, long resequencing data available and also short resequencing. So we have 12 event, electron splice event that are identified by both the cell line and also the breast cancer tissue samples. And we saw we have five, six of this event validated by the Pike Bio long read ISO 6 data. So here, the figure B shows, you know, their, 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 their quantification either by the PSO from RNC or the isoform fractions in the ISO 6, which is guided by the long read. And we, we find pretty much a uh, high concordance between them, suggesting the PSO method do have accurate a uh, uh, way to measure the quantification. And then later we use the RT-PCR to validate all our discoveries from the long read sequencing. We can validate the, we, we can validate the pattern of this event. And so also we saw their, 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 their fractions. So, uh, so back to this uh, acron splicing because it's an crypt intron within the axons we are very eager to compare this with conventional intron, how it looks like, a, you know, compared with this, this console intron, conventional introns. So some intron we know that they may be retained, tend to be retained uh, at the alternative splicing isoform. So actual splicing actually have some similar function behavior like a retained intron, but different that when the, re, when the intron is retained, it will generate some protein change or maybe trigger non-sensitivity decay to degrade this transcript. However, on the, the retained excitron is the normal transcript, but the, the splice excitron actually can change the protein structure, or if they generate pre-mutual pre terminal codon, they will trigger non sensitivity decay. So first of all, we want to say, we want to test using existing tools, because existing tools can deal with the retained introns. Can they also, in some way, they find excitrons? And the answer is no. When we do the overlap, we, we collect all the retained intron from a pan prior, prior pan cancer studies. We find no overlap between excitrons with uh, retained intron, and also with, uh, with, with no uh, overlap with, uh, uh, with uh, how no overlap with the concealed introns. Then we look at a few assist uh, features, including five prime size score, three prime size score, GC content, the lens. We confirm that. Excitrons compared with the retained intron, console intron, they have low, uh, weak splice size signal and also high GC content, and also they have a shorter length. So also we test uh, this from the evolutionary point of view. We compare excitrons with axons, with retained introns, with console introns. So we find that actually excitrons and axons are more conserved but uh, retaining introns and concealed introns are less conserved, suggesting uh, excitrons are more, have more like axon-like property. So it's not more like an uh, intron. And then last of all, evaluate the NFD effect. So there are some rules. Uh, we can say that if you are a uh, terminal codon, if it's a frame shape event, fall into a few specific regions, you may escape the NFD to be degraded degraded So if you like like 200, first 200 base pair or the last exon plus 15 base pair, uh, you know, shorter than uh, close to the last exon, exon junction. We actually find compared with exon splicing and intron retention, exon splicing demonstrate a higher potential of non-sensitivity decay, decay, escaped event than the intron retention. This is very, very important because that will affect proteins. If it is already degraded, they, they may not have any effect on proteins, but it turns out excitrons has more uh, dramatic effect on proteins than the intron retention. So next question we want to answer because it's, we show the data is different from intron retention, different from other splicing mechanism. Is there any specific mechanism controlling or regulating this electron splicing event in cancer? So to answer this question, we first uh, evaluate 
the burdens between, uh, you know, the actual splice burden between tumor and normal samples. And then we want to find the different splice actrons so that we can use this actron to try to correlate with, with reg some regulators to answer whether or not some, some, there's some specific controlling mechanism. First of all, based on eight cancer type we selected, they have tumor and match normal pairs, at least 40 samples. And based on the meta analysis, we find the, in general, tumor has a higher burden of extra splicing than normal. And then we using the differential splicing analysis, we find the, uh, around, I, I think 16, a trans-splicing event. There are different splices between tumor and normal um, in more than one cancer types. And I show you one or uh, two examples from this list. One is from the um, Fox04 here. This is the uh, exitrons, I think, caused the frame shifting event. Because this frame shifts, frame shifted uh, uh, reading frame. Uh, Cause the same terminal and uh, loss, and then we saw this exitrons highly uh, had higher expression level than normal level, suggesting this loss of source C terminal function domain will cause this Foxy one loss of function. And indeed, Foxy one is a known tumor suppressor gene. Another example is, is SPEN. This is another tumor known tumor suppressor gene. The, this exitron causes an in-frame change, but they, this frame a target to the domain of SMRT interaction domain. And this highly elevated uh, uh, in-frame transcript will cause uh, this uh, uh, SPEN uh, gene loss of its transcriptional activities. So this data suggesting extron will be functionally important uh, to change the protein, uh, to change the protein function. And then, uh, we look at the uh, splicing factor genes, their expression profile, because extra is type of splicing event and splicing factor controls somehow relate to this, this kind of splicing event. Uh, we will say how that looks. And it's very surprising that for the cancer type that have a higher, higher extra burdens like here and here, they are clustered together. But and, and then we uh, look at uh, look at it further. We divide patient into uh, based on the actron low, based into high and low, and we find the uh, splicing factor gene signatures has a, a significant correlation with the actron low, suggesting splicing factor play a role to regulate this actron splicing event. Then we want to nominate specific uh, you know uh, regulators for this actron splicing event. And we use uh, a generalized detailed model. And we, we try to, we try to uh, build the relation between the delta PSO, which is the changes of actron splicing, and also the gene expression change of uh, using log2 for the change tumor versus normal for splicing factor gene expression values. And we find uh, in the eight cancer type, we selected over 50% of, of this exitron are explainable by the change of uh, spline factors. And then here I show the top nominated uh, spline factor correlates with uh, the actron splicing change. Generally, they promote actron splicing change. Uh, they are, and when they do the pathway line, we find they are enriched in spicer, MRI trans transport, and also MRI surveillance pathways. So that's the question for the, for the uh, mechanism of regulating uh, actron splicing event. And the third question will be how actron impact, you know, gene functions. Um, to answer this question, before first, what, what, what we did is to identify the tumor specific exitrons. Uh, this is, I think, analog to the somatic mutations because somatic mutations specific to cancer, and uh, they use this as a tool to divide to discover driver genes. So we want to say whether or not we can find specific. Uh, tumor specific extrons and use this as, a, as an evidence to nominate the genes that maybe have driver potential. So it turns out that uh, many of the extron we detect in tumor, they are, uh, they are actually tumor specific. That means this extron only spliced in tumor samples. They did not splice in JTEX normal samples. They also very low frequently splice in the matched uh, 
TCG normal samples. Again, if you look at the tumor specific extron burden, the ORM cancer, which has high burden of extron, also have a tumor specific high uh, tumor specific extron burden, also is high. So that's very uh, expected. And we find that uh, about 40% of these uh, tumor specific extrons are recurrent. So they occurred in more than one patient. So, and then we sort of will look at a few uh, extron, uh, tumor specific extrons, how they correlate with clinical survival data. Uh, we, we aim to identify the clinical, clinically informative uh, extron, tumor specific extrons. So we use three survival uh, data or survival program for free survival, disease free survival. And we find around 20 of these uh, extrons, they have, they have correlation with, with survivals in more than one cancer types. And here I show you an example of this EWSR1 extrons correlated with overall survival in this cancer and also correlated with disease free survival in this uterus cancer. The next, after we have determined the tumor specific extron, we want to find the genes enriched with these extrons. Uh, we propose a frequency-based uh, approach. I think this also about the idea for the somatic uh, mutation analysis. They they just based on the frequency approach, frequency-based approach to nominate you know driver genes. So we we calculate uh, gene-specific electron enrichment score or enrichment probability based on binomial distribution, considering background electron uh, splicing rate of a cancer type and also number of extra event in a gene, and also the total length of the coding exon of this particular gene. So here this uh, bubble plot uh, heat map shows the top nominated, uh, 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 they call, I call them significantly extra spliced gene, SEGs across this uh, pan-cancer analysis. Um, there are some genes, they have, they, have, they have different patterns. Some genes are, Consider as SEG across multiple cancer type, but some only like in you know, one specific cancer type. So here I show three genes. It's uh, they are EWSR1, top 15, and a few genes. They actually come from uh, they form a special gene family called FET gene family. And there are some literature report that they are related to cancer. And in the protein protein interaction, interaction network, we can say they are very have very heavily close interaction between each other. So suggesting in our list that for the our SEG top ranked list, we can find some uh, clinically relevant or cancer driver gene relevant genes. But we also we also want to dig further for this. So that brings us to find one gene, nominated one gene here. Uh, this is a prostate cancer specific SEG. It's a gene name is NEFH. So initially, um, for the NEFH, we know nothing about it, especially for prostate cancer. There's no literary report for what is the function in prostate cancer. But since we nominate that as a prostate cancer specific SEG, we thought maybe it plays some roles in prostate cancer. And the first one we want to de 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 determine is this like a role of a tumor suppressor gene or oncogene. So we we use the expression profile. We look at the, you know, the NEF expression in normal prostate tissues and also in tumor tissues. And tumor tissues, we, we divide them into a different category based on their Gleason score. So Gleason score is a scoring system measuring the tumor aggressiveness. The higher of the score, the more aggressive of the tumors. So we find that actually this gene highly expressed in normal, but very low expressed in the are in a higher stage of tumors. We got another uh, data site that include the benign sample, localized sample, and metastatic prostate tissue samples. And we find the same trend that is highly expressed in normal, but uh, uh, has a very low experiment value in the advanced stage of prostate cancer. Again, also we call it the survival data suggesting high expression of the gene have a better survival and by low expression of the gene, such as uh, indicate the low or uh, very bad survival. So this data suggests that this may potentially NEF function like a tumor suppressor gene. And then we need to validate it as well. So my collaborator from Northwestern, they did uh, the functional analysis for us. So they already expressed NEF H wild type and also NEF transcript, you know, cancer, prostate cancer cell. 
and then we find when we only try the normal uh, the the wild type samples, it reduces the tumor growth. However, when we only only try the acron spliced uh, protein, they doesn't have any change compared with empty vector, suggesting that um, EFH is a tumor suppressor gene. But acron splicing occurred in this tumor suppressor gene disrupt the you know tumor suppressor functions, and further we use uh, call information also validate this cancer phenotype as well. So we think another question: Why previously in the literature in the field people didn't recognize this NEF gene in prostate cancer? Then we look at the mutational profile from the SIBO portal. In either the primary tumor or the metastatic tumor, we find the mutation rate is very low. It's around 1% or maybe lower than 1%. So that will answer, that this answers our question actually, uh, because traditional people use, like uh, my, my first few slides, use mutation to nominate driver genes. But since NEF is not uh, highly mutated, so this. We miss that during a mutational profile, but we get it using the actron splicing profile. So to look at whether or not this is true for in pan cancer wise, we look at uh, we compare you know the uh, SEG significant actron splice genes and also SMGs significant mutated genes. Clearly, they you know are they divide into two group like TB53, uh, KRAS. This gene, BRAF, this gene are highly mutated. But their mutation, but their actron splicing load uh, burden is low. For the actron spliced genes, their mutation burden is, is also low. So they show some mutual exclusive patterns. When we look at this in each individual cancer type, uh, we find this confirm this mutual mutual exclusive pattern uh, very uh, very significantly. Then we dig this further, we want to see whether or not we can find some pathogenic or look like uh, some driver, uh, trans, uh, driver tumor specific actron splicing event. This, we, this time we focus on the prostate cancer uh, cohort uh, and we, we, we nominate one gene here is FOXY1. We find that this gene are uh, enriched for both exitron and also mutations. And in the patient level, we clear, even though it's enriched for both mutation and exitron, we saw the clear uh, mutual exclusive pattern as well. So when we look at this further, here shows how the mutation in the upper panel have the effect on, on the protein domain of the FOXC1 and how the exitron has a protein, they target the you know, protein domain. There's one paper published actually two years ago by Oruchi Ness Lab in Nature. They have uh, described distinct uh, classes of activity in uh, FOX1 alterations. One of them is focused on the mutation in the FOX high domain, and they have active in roles. And when we look at this, uh, this uh, 3D structure, we find they both reside in the FOX high domain, but they, they in the different subregions, like uh, for mutation, they are in like this purple line shows. There are these mutations, they locate in the VIN2 region. That's the region that's showing the activating roles. But our exitron are located in the VIN1 region. However, whether or not they have the activating roles for FOX even function, we don't quite for sure yet. So i come up again for functional analysis. My collaborator helped us to generate two uh, mutated clones. Uh, they all have exitrons, you know, targeting the FOX high domain, and we all exploit them. And we first of test whether or not that affect the, the transcriptional fact activity for FOX E1 because FOX E1 is a transfer factor. So using the Luciferase uh, reporter assays, we find that indeed the two uh, clones, the two mutated clones, they have increased transcriptional activities. And also we test the cell proliferation for phenotype. It shows that two uh, mutated clones can increase the cell proliferation. And then next for FOXY1, we, um, we think uh, uh, because in prostate cancer, FOXY1 and the receptor is really uh, has a very close relationship. FOXY1 is a pioneer factor. It's first bind to DNA. And when it's open chromatins, then the, it can bring AR to bind to the region and regulate to AR target gene, then regular AR signaling pathway, that's our central signaling pathway in prostate cancer, the drug prostate cancer phenotype. 
then they find that upregulated genes, when they look at the uh, patient that had high uh, burden of tumor specific extracts, for these upregulated genes, and we tag their regulators, we find FOXY1 and AR are the major regulators of this group of genes. So suggesting indeed they affect IR splice, IR signaling. And then we use TEMPERS2, which is uh, AR targeted genes. We, te uh, we test it's uh, like a promoter luciferase activity. We find this FOXY1 uh, mutant also increase the activity of this TEMPER2 uh, activity, suggesting it's increased IR targeted gene signature. And then we also confirm the phenotype using the uh, color information assays. All this suggests that uh, actual splicing can like uh, mutation affect gene function either through gain of function or loss of function. So, uh, and we confirm that using the experiment. The last question I believe um, is, um, is how this actual, because they change protein, but not only the function, but they may generate some novel peptides. How can it be employed for cancer immune therapy, especially for uh, new antigen generations. So here is uh, uh, the graph shows our general hypothesis also provide very nicely uh, uh, drawn by the ACIR uh, org. So we have the elevated splicing factor activity. It can draw the actual splicing up regulated. And if uh, we don't have any mutation for this gene that can change its proteins through actual splicing. And it can change, uh, can deliver to, can, can generate some novel peptides. So this peptides can, if this like tumor specific, they may generate new antigens. And if this new antigens are present by the MHC, MHC complex and also recognized by T cell, then likely it to be uh, immunogenic. And for the burdens of this tu uh, tumor specific extra um, new antigens, they may correlate with the anti-tumor immune response, uh, like demonstrated by the CD8 T cell, CD4 T cell, and the macrophage. And also eventually they may predict response to checkpoint blockade. So to test this hypothesis, first of all, we, um, we, we, we start to find how many of these tumors with electron can generate in-frame or generate a frame shift event. Uh, so the major event are still in frame. It's about 56%, but the frame shifting is also in a high percentage, it's 44%. Suggesting many now peptide can be generated due, due to the tumor specific extra due to this frame shifting event. And also we compare that with the intra retention a little bit because intra retention has been in the literature report as a source of new antigen. We find that um, Actual splice transcript generally have higher uh, expression, expression level than the intron retention. And this is why, because I showed this figure before, uh, actual splicing tend to, if they, are, they generate frame shift even, they tend to escape the non-sense immediate decay based on the rules that uh, the known rules of uh, non-sense immediate decay escape. Uh, however, intron retention tend to trigger necessary BTK to be degraded. So that's why I may explain why the electron splicing transcript generally demonstrates a higher expression value than the re retained intron. Then the next question is, we want to predict a new antigen from the tumor specific extrons. So we use the tool, which is uh, scan new. Uh, we developed that actually uh, prior to our uh, actual splicing study, we use this to identify indel derived new antigen from the RNA-seq data. But given the similarity between the deletion and exitrons, we want to borrow this tool to detect actual splicing derived new antigens. So this is our general workflow. We just published in STAR, a STAR protocol to describe this actual splicing new antigen detection work. So it starts with tumor RNA-seq, normal RNA-seq, and also we run scan extron to find the extrons, and also we find the tumor specific extrons based on the normal control. And then we implement a parallel algorithm to detect uh, uh, splicing, uh, actron, tumor specific extron splicing derived new antigens. So with that tool, we detect extrons, but we first we need to validate our discoveries using the proteomic data. So we use two types of proteomic data. 
One is the whole cell, that's a regular proteomic data. The other is immunopeptidomic data. So for the whole cell data, we use the data from derived from the CPTAC cohort. They have a lot of proteomic data. And uh, several, several TCG samples also has a match up mass spectrum data. So we test the, uh, you know, the validated peptides using this mass spectrum data and find that in ovarian cancer, it has high extra derived pep, new antigen peptide are confirmed by this proteomic data. Uh, this is uh, this, uh, very uh, as effective because it has a, ovarian cancer has a high burden of exitrons. And also we find in the low burden of tumor like uh, renal cell carcinoma, glioblastoma, they, they are actually uh, confirmed. They are uh, mass proteomic data confirmed extron splice new antigen are higher than the, than the uh, indel or SNV derived new antigens. But uh, later on for the, for the lung cancer, it has higher potential of uh, higher fraction of um, SNV or indel derived new antigen confirmation rate, suggesting that because lung cancer is highly mutated, so they don't have too much uh, actron splice derived new antigens. So also the whole cell proteomic can, can validate the presence of the, the splicing junction derived peptides. They can now tell us whether or not they have the immunogenic potential. So we use this another uh, data site, it's called the immunopeptidomics data site. The, 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 the advantage for this is they can tell you directly whether or not this confirmed peptide using the mass spectrum data are the MHC complex com, uh, associated peptides. So this is uh, how their uh, experiment work, works with. We didn't do the experiment, but we just download the data for, of the immunopeptidomic data. So here is one new antigen that we find, we predict that from a tumor specific actron splicing event here, this is a frame shifting event. And we indeed we find in this PRPF8 genes, we use uh, immune peptidomic data, we confirm we use uh, through the mass, mass spectrometry uh, profile. And the next question is, we confirm it's per precise by MHC, we want to see whether or not they have immunogenic potential. So we calculate a score through a machine learning approach, which is called hydro, uh, immunogenicity score, it's just uh, calculated this based on the uh, hydrophobic uh, content. Uh, so they just, uh, did, uh, based on the immunogenic peptides from the IEDB, so database, and also non-immunogenic peptides to calculate the score. So this is our score. And we compare our electron splicing derived new antigens with some exper experimentally validated immunogenic uh, nonsense media, uh, non uh, nonsense SMA derived new antigen and also some run controls. And also we include some frame shifting indel derived new antigen. They also experimentally validated they are immunogenic. We find that based on the immunogenicity gen score, they have higher immunogenic potential or than the you know, SMV derived or indel derived the new antigens. Then we use a third, um, Third criteria, which is uh, the, uh, the new ORF. New ORF is a novel ozone reading frame, and we test the lens because in the literature they report that the long, the long longer of your new ORF lens, the more likely this this new antigen can be recognized by T cell. So compared with the indels of of experiment validated new antigen, they have very long, uh, significantly longer uh, new ORF lens. So this suggests that. Tumor space extrons not only present by MHC, but I also have a high potential recognized by T cell. And then after we confirm that, we'll go back to the TCJ data, we we'll look at the uh, tumor space extron burden across cancer types. And we want to see whether or not they can correlate with the immune response. So with this immune signatures, we find that um, it specifically correlates with uh, macrophage M1, CD8, 4, CD8. CD8 8 T cell signatures, suggesting that new antigen load of the derived from tumor specific extrons can correlate with immune response. And lastly, we want to answer how can we apply that for the clinical implications. So that's what will draw us to answer the question for checkpoint immunotherapy response. 
Um, right, we want to know whether or not tumor specific extron neoadjuvant burden can predict the response. So we come up with two uh, cancer types, melanoma and uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So it turns out that from the three cohorts, they have the they have the clinical data for patient. All these patients that receive FDA approved drug for checkpoint PBE immunotherapy, and we know that who are responders, who are non responders. We didn't find any correlation for extra splicing DRAM new antigen. However, we do find the uh, uh, correlations in the renal cell carcinoma. Um, so we we further confirm this using the RC crow, and we compare the new uh, the new antigen load of tumor specific extra with some known markers of the immune res immune therapy response mark like a CDA T cell, a PDL1 mutation burden. Again, we got the same trend in renal cell carcinoma, tumor specific exitron burden top rank the top based on the ALC uh, value. But for the melanoma, uh, all these snow markers do uh, play an important role than, uh, than the exitron splicing burdens. Uh, this is expected because in melanoma, it's a high mutational burden. The mutation may play a very important role, but for renal cell carcinoma, the mutation rate, mutation rate is low than the melanoma. So for potentially, I think we think that uh, new antigen may be contribute to, to this uh, uh, lower low mutational burden tumor for their further for for their, um, predictions of the immunotherapy response. And then we dig into further, we check the event that escape necessary decay and also event that trigger necessary decay. It turned out that the burden of the burden that the burden of a uh, new uh, new agent that escape necessary decay significantly correlates with the uh, clinical benefit, but not for the for this case of triggering necessary decay. So suggesting necessary decay play an important role to predict immune therapy response for new antigen. Uh, for carcinoma, uh, renal cell carcinoma, this type of disease. Um, lastly, I think we uh, look at some other cancer types. Some other cancer types have, do not have FDA approved drug for the treatment of immunotherapy, but we try to infer whether or not we can, they can be utilized for this type of tumors. So the top two tumors, based on our G, select gene markers, that are immune-related gene markers like PD-1, pd one the top rank is ovarian cancer and also kidney uh, renal cell carcinoma. We already see that renal cell carcinoma using this electron splicing uh, derived new antigen burden can predict a response to immunotherapy. So that's uh, just to suggest that maybe ovarian cancer is the next target for this new antigen splicing, uh, you know, uh, tumor specific electron splicing de derived new antigen to be used for predict the immunotherapy response for, for ovarian cancer. So I think that's my last uh, uh, report, last result. In summary, um, so there are like we conduct the pan cancer research, uh, we deliver the landscape of transplicing event in cancer, and we find that that transplicing disrupts you know, the functional protein domain to cause cancer drug effect. And also they are mutually inclusive with DNA mutations. Um, like here, and also they may using immune peptide analysis where identify actron splicing uh, derived new antigens, and the actron splicing new antigen load can predict a response to uh, can, uh, checkpoint inhibition therapy, especially potentially uh, potentially for ovarian cancer uh, uh, type. Some future work. First of all, we can further improve the scan exitron because. Our current extra de depends on they are using canonical splice site, but for the non canonical splice site, we just totally ignore them. But we have figured out a way through multi omics study to detect them. And also, we want to detect and characterize pathogenic tumor specific extra and, 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 and also significant extra splice genes and whether or not they, are, they have driver potential. And then prioritize our tumor specific extrons, uh, tumor specific extrons derived new antigen for personalized cancer vaccine development in the future. That's more like towards personalized uh, oncology. Uh, and also, we want to build an uh, interactive customized browser that for users, because it's really a valuable resource, we believe, so for users to navigate our discoveries through either extrons or either extrons derived new antigen. 
So um, I at my lab uh, have uh, two postdocs, three students, and one uh, two postdocs, two students, and also one uh, biomathematician. So the two of the field are allowed to this electron splicing work. And also thank my collaborator from the University of Minnesota and Northwestern University. They have to do the functional validations and this is the funding support. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Nando. Uh, for the questions, maybe we can let uh, the virtual audience to start. Uh, Any one of you can just feel free to unmute yourself and start asking questions. Anyone who's online? Hi, Randong. Uh, I have one question. This is Martin. Um, have you considered um, this, this excitron splicing events to be an artifact of the RT, reverse transcriptase enzyme? Because I believe your validations also use RT uh, followed by Sanger for validation. Have you, have, you, have you thought about using something which doesn't use RT to validate those events? That's a very, very great point, uh, Marcin. Actually, you, <laughs> you really, uh, maybe you need to now find the literature. So there's one paper actually uh, follow up our study. They published in genome research. They did a long resequencing and they used nanopore. And nanopore has two kind of platform, direct RNA sequencing and also CDN sequencing. So they find that actually they find some excitron splicing event. They can only find them from the CDA uh, platform, but they didn't find from the direct RNA sequencing and they can validate them as well. So that's kind of artifact suggesting this is because of reverse transcription. So we indeed find this kind of artifact. We are working on to improve the, uh, the, the scan excitron uh, uh, method to try to remove this type of artifact. So that's a very, very excellent question. Thank you. Hi, Rendang. How are you doing? This is Rule. Hi. How are you doing? Good yeah, to see you again, you? I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a question in terms of um, uh, the level of expression uh, of these excitrons um, relative to the parent gene, I guess, uh, as well as um, um, ha have you quantitated the, any proteins coming from these um, excitrons and what's the level of those proteins as well as if the um, potential junctions of these excitrons are indeed uh, recurrent, and um, are they do they form in subsets of cancer patients, or uh, for example, in breast cancer, are they found across the entire breast cancer cohort, or small subsets, and are each of the sort of excitrons um, recurrent in in nature? Thank you very much. That's a very excellent point. Yes. So in general, in the transcriptome level for the electron splice transcript, they are uh, fractions low. So, so you can see some of my slides, they may be around like 10% uh, or maybe even less than 10%, 5%. Uh, for the protein level, we didn't have a way to quantify it. We just use uh, uh, proteomic data to validate them. They are present in protein levels. Um, uh, there's a... Um, um, we are working on another, uh, I think, uh, for, 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 for functional validations because our functional validation is just, uh, we overexpress that for the mutant. Maybe in the future, we just do a combination. So for example, we have 80% of wild type, 20% of the electron splice transcript for uh, overexpression, or maybe 90% of wild type, 10% of this uh, transcript. Say so we want to reach whether there's a cutoff that can really drive the phenotype. So that's kind of, but in general, uh, I think this extra trans, um, we, we, that's a, actually the very great, great point. We didn't test this extra, how they are distribution across different molecular subtypes. Um, we can do that for based on, for example, in prostate cancer, there are molecular subtypes uh, as well, but no, we didn't see that uh, very uh, intensively. Uh, but in general, some excitron do, they may sometimes have a hundred percent splicing uh, fraction, fractions, but it's very, very rare. Mostly they are just a low around like 10% or maybe even lower than 10%, but still we think they may be functional 
uh, uh, but just uh, have a low percentage. That's why they they didn't notice them uh, or annotate them in the in the in the in the reference reference genome, right? Because they are just uh, retained in general. Uh, and also, they didn't find them in the normal samples, in JTAG samples, in the TCG normal samples. But we can find a substantial high price, high um, fraction in tumor samples. So, so I get, I guess then at such a low expression, then they must have a dominant effect, I guess, in order to have a functional effect, right? Yes, probably yes. So I, I, I really. You know, maybe next step. A next step is just to, uh, you know, study this different, this different, different type, different uh, event through a function study. Whether or not, which we do have plans. We want to say how much percentage it may reach the uh, a level that can drive the phenotype. Maybe only five percent is okay. Maybe only ten percent is okay. But they have not got there yet. Great. Just one follow-up question in terms of. Have you ever tried to overexpress some of the splicing factors in some way to sort of see if you can uh, magnify this um, effect exactly. or these expression of these exceptions? Exactly, that's our next plan because we're normally using the DM model, we normally specific regulators target this exon splicing event. Then we will find this collaborator to do this kind of a specific splicing factor study, whether or not this controls this. Uh, uh, we just uh, competitionally we build a link, but we want to validate it them as well. That depends on our next uh, plan for our, whether or not we can find good, good collaborator to do this kind of work. Great. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> hi, I'm hi, Rol. Good to see you. This is Brian. Um, we're we're down here on the on the campus. Um, I got a question. It's just more general. Have you seen the excitrons are aware of their role in say neurogenesis or organogenesis, other, other biological um, functional developmental pathways? I mean, uh, do you expect to see those play such a role as you see with the cancer? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a very, very great point. I did expect to see them in the other uh, neurodegenerative disease. So uh, brain, brain kind of disease, uh, actually, um, this excitrons first, they studied in the plant. This, they, they find this plant, not in human, but they also find this in human tissues, normal tissues. Uh, definitely, they can, they, they, they fought this on cancer, but in other type of disease, we can definitely do that. Uh, we haven't tested it yet, but there are a lot of RNA sequencing data available. We can definitely uh, see whether or not, I'm 100% uh, sure they do have, to some degree, has the extra splicing event occur, but whether or not they will, uh, will be a driving factor, uh, we have not, uh, you know, uh, we don't know it for sure. Yeah, thanks. I could see the neuroregenerative yes. diseases as be a place to look. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So first, thank you for a really comprehensive overview of, of that topic. It was really uh, impressive breadth there. Um, the rule asked a lot of my questions that related to, to frequency and so on, but one of the other implications and sort of the difference between a mutation-based process and this process, which I might describe as being secondary to poor splicing, I might imagine that these would be later developments in the cancer after a, a series of events had happened. So do you have any evidence about the time course of, of their importance? Yes, I agree with you. I think that's somehow controlled by the splicing factor, either the, you know, the, the uh, expression change of splicing factor, you know, splicing factor dysregulation causes abnormal splicing event, or the mutation change, you know, there's a mutations in spline factors. Actually, you read my mind tomorrow for my chalk talk. Or another uh, future work is to find the cis acting mutations or trans QTL associated with this kind of acron splicing event. And uh, we didn't test that yet. We just, for this public paper, we just saw the splicing factor dysregulation in the RNA level, but definitely the DNA change will also cause this splicing change. So I think that's maybe a, a fact potentially, uh, you know, uh, derived from this 
mutational change from splice factors. Yeah, because I think what you're getting at is if the way around my argument is that if you have a specific specific splicing factor that creates a specific exitron, it could be an early mutational driver. Exactly, exactly. I totally agree with you on that. Further questions from our online audience? Brendan, I have one more question, maybe a philosophical more a little bit. Uh, so you, you show uh, that those um, excitrons, that they are uh, more abundant in, um, in cancer. And you also show that they are potentially immunogenic. Um, why, why would a cancer cell generate those, those potentially immunogenic uh, RNAs and proteins which, which might, might not help it to survive the attack by the immune system? Um, that's a great question. So I think generally like similar to mutations, you know, the, the, in cancer cell, you, ha you harbor mutations, right? And this mutation, if they did with protein, they will generate, for example, indels, if they are frame shifting indels, then you generate some novel peptides. The only thing I think why we excited discovery is that I showed the slide. We compares extron splicing with intron retention. You know, intron retention also another uh, uh, alternative splicing have been heavily studied in cancer. It's play a very important role. But we find that actually intron retention tend to trigger non-sensitivity decay. You know, we using the RNA surveillance mechanism to 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 remove this you know kind of noise or 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 some abnormal transcript. But based on our our, our uh, analysis, we find extra splicing actually tend to escape this non sensitivity decay and it stays in nucleus and then transport to cytoplasma and to, then deliver to protein. So more proteins or more peptides or more in, new antigens may be derived from this extron splicing event. I think that's maybe because they, they, they maybe have some unique distinct properties compared with intron retention. And then that uh, could be somehow um, uh, escape this kind of surveillance mechanism to, to in, in, especially in tumor cells. Uh, so that's like why we are interested to, to look at that. So that thank you. Hard. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, given the time is late, uh, thank you, Rindo. Uh, let's uh, give another round of applause.